Okay, tonight's featured reader is Kelly Morehouse. Yay. <laughs> Kelly Morehouse has immersed herself in the Sylvan Poetry Association since the year 2000 with readings, festivals, open mics, and on five accounts, research past poets' lives and work in order to become them in dead poets' events. All this has greatly enriched her own poetic series. Senses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so without any further ado, here is Kelly Morehouse. Thank you, everyone, for coming. That's great. I'm, I'm... Turn it up, Mark. <laughs> well, I got to speak into the mic. <laughs> There's the first thing. Okay, how's that for sound? Okay. Okay. Um, so you know my name, and I want to tell just a little bit about why I write poetry and who, who are the influences on me. I have to not talk too long. I was going to be a minute. <laughs> um, um, a great influence on me is Audrian Rich, uh, who's per whose name is pronounced Audrian because I went and saw her in Portland. And so I'm, I'm lucky enough to know that, yes, it is Audrian, when I'm corrected. <laughs> and anyway, she does a lot what I like to do in poetry. And um, I want one of the things she does um, is to um, explore and excavate um, the treasures of women's histories. And that's how I started out uh, wanting to, when I started out learning about um, past poets of the 1920s and 30s, I, I really delved into what they were writing about because that's the era of my, my grandmother, grandmothers of both who I didn't get to know because they, they passed away too early. Um, but through these other women writers, I could um, learn a lot about the era and times. So, I have a little poem um, to a tribute to Audrey and Rich. She died in 2015, and um, it tells a bit about how she influenced me. It's called Looking Out and Looking In. You led me to the opal stream, to words that filled my ear, turned things inside out and outside in for eyes to see differently. My bed diagonal set in meadow grasses, no walls to obstruct the early morning light, stretching over hills and open field, this whole wide world my home. Morning light falls equally on me as it falls on petals that open to the touch of dawn. It falls on you like a kiss from the sun. Out of small paned window to wide open field, I bask in expansiveness. The whole new world, my home. I, and I want to ask everyone uh, to hold the, the applause to the end, just because these are kind of short poems and uh, that'd be nice, thank you. So, um, I don't usually, I do read poetry at least once a month, but I don't get to read a body of work like this. And I really am I'm thankful for the opportunity, Mark asking and, and you being here, um, because I, can ch I chose some poems that kind of talk about my process it's through this, through this reading. You'll, You'll, um, you'll see the process that I um, move that on the way that I that I'm working on. So I'm exploring meaning and language 
and the interior life, most of all, through my poetry, with my poetry. I don't do it to publish it. I don't do it to um, get it out there, except for that it's, it's a great opportunity to read it to, to, to an audience, especially people I'm close to and I've been friends with, and that's great. So I'm watching my watch. This is called At the Lake, and it's about um, language, how, how language works and how language doesn't work in the, in the same poem. Our boat floats away from shore with only minor creaking. The two of us in the red canoe before light rises. Winged words lift, flit softly back and forth between us. Some feathers lost, some worn to under colors, while new words fill their chest to sing. Less and less I expect what's on the cover. Words draped in reds like love I've grown to suspect. If I change from red hot love to yellows instead, or argue for the colorless, will my words and yours still find each other? Light rising, I see the strings of words you wear around your neck, like stones, words like pink, unspoken. On the bedside table, they seem familiar, and on the lake appear as anchors as we row closer and closer to shore. As often, though, before I know it, words shift into minnows, as before, beneath the boat, darting into shadows. So um, that's one way I'm saying words work. Here's another, another idea of how words work. This is a, there's a quote here by Virginia Woolf called, or, or that is, things may not always land on all fours. And the name of it is the nerve to catch or say the slippery things. The unspoken, unnamed particles of difficult things to say may as well float among clouds and stars and around our boisterous moon that has not a speck of shame. When I try to capture them, they tangle in my throat, accumulate in large, bigger than myself. I try to squeeze them into tidy boxes, label them as needs and sorrows, find layers of language to wrap each one. Each examined difficult thing to say, can it, once released, have a single hope of landing on all fours? Will the trusted other have the nerve the vivacity to stand right there and pick it up, the slippery, just-born thing having plopped itself down on the kitchen floor. Okay, now I'm going to move to some that come from dreams, a few that come from dreams. And um, this one's called, well, they're actually both about horses. And let me tell you about horses. They scare the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and my good friend has let me ride her horses and they, they know I'm scared and they run away with me. So, so I'll give you that heads up on this poem. My fear, my friend. Charcoal or chestnut colored, it's hard to tell, too dark to see, but an early wintry morning, the animal steps out from shadows, approaches me, so quietly I do not hear or see it come. When I do, its long neck is nuzzled up to mine. I'd be terrified 
Had I a moment's thought? Now its soft breath, its warmth, firmness on my skin, breaks through the paper wall of intimacy. I do not move to touch it. It stands close, strong, and passionate, gentle as a lamb. It continues to linger at my neck, pressing the moments before I wake, when the horse bolts back into night and I step into day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this one is, uh, has a quote from Virginia Woolf. Uh, not everything does, that just sounds like it. <laughs> just the ones I picked for you today. Um, this is called Wild Horse, and there's a, a quote from her that is that says, there is no denying the wild horse in us all. So, wild horse. The best I can do in a day is write a poem, laugh with a friend, learn something new. Nights are the harder part of days. Dragging muddy roots through the bedroom, layered in leaves and rotting soil, making its determined trek of finding me. Light from the street pierces the four corners of the room, hoping to find me helplessly coiled in the covers, eyes wide open and waiting, waiting for approaching sound. I am struggling with ghastly shadows moving up and down, bony fingers scraping the wall. When morning sneaks into the room, shows that everything is set and ready to go, an opening to enter right in front of me. I rise, half-open eyes, straddle the horse and gallop away. So that's almost the opposite of the other poem at the end. Um, one, I'm going into day, and the other one, I go into, I, I straddle the horse and go with it, so. Okay. Mm, I think my, my moments are gonna flee away. You got all kinds of time. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to read one that my sister and my family don't like to hear because uh, it's called a nod to death. And it's, they said that, 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 that word and you shouldn't be in the same, in the same sentence. But this is during a COVID poem actually. And it's about how we meet death. And, and I like it, I hope you like it too. Okay, a nod to death. The way we think about dying doesn't seem thought out. It is how we meet it that matters most. Creatures of fertile minds, why the lean possibilities, the ivy strangling us from speaking? We grapple with the theory of nothing. The lights go out. That's it. I want an open door door with the yellow light drawing me through to beyond my knowing. Damp and wet, enclosed too long inside the body, my spirit may head south, bask in the sun on a high plateau. I'll be ready if the door is close, lying in yoga's last pose, the death pose, where I breathe slowly, inhale, exhale, taking the time to find the place of peace. Loosen my grip, let go. I see it's a good way to die. See, I need more practice. But no, absolutely not will I trade my last few days fighting the fight with death nor in my final hour start the fatal gasping in the struggle with my fears. Sorry, it might be a little hard, but I hope not. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, now this is lighter. Two of them. Okay. Uh, this is called ancestral bones. It doesn't sound lighter, but it is. <laughs> and there's a reference to the state hospital. It's not called the state hospital in this poem. It's called the Hawthorne Hospital because Dr. Hawthorne is the one who started it in Portland and then it moved, eventually moved to Salem and became the Oregon State Hospital. So th there's that reference. Ancestral bones. Bones in my body clamor for an ancestor to attach to, like my skeletal structure clearly from my mother down to the duplication of my fingers, though not the toes, clearly from my father. Black and white photos of my grandmother show a replicate of my nose, shadows accumulating under my eyes, and grandfather from the other side whom I never met, the weak wandering eye. Of the excess of generational rules bequeathed to me, talents untagged, slight curl in my hair and way I stand, which of the hundreds or more ancestral traits can I be mirroring? Not great aunt Maggie, stubborn and discarded at Hawthorne's hospital by the last of three husbands. Ask me later what becomes of the difficult ones. And what of the limits of a, of a language, ways in which we are taught to think? Against all odds, I struggle to remake, reshape, and claim any spare part of me I can call my own. Now, this is about my ancestors, the next one, um, called A Very Delicate Matter, 1932. And I, got, I was given a flower by a friend that's in this audience called, he probably calls it the Queen of Night. I renamed it to the Goddess of the Night. It's a tropical flower blooming one night a year, and then it's done. Okay, a very delicate matter, 1932. Swirling in satin top and velvet skirt to new hot jazz, she feels alive, not to the sum of all her years. From the piano, the youthful man has caught her eye. She dances on. Her years read his need for a pretty face. His youth does not read her need to break taboos. By evening's end, the two of them waltz into the light of the moon, into the lure of tendrils and tender petals, binding them as lovers in the fragrance of eternity. By dawn, the flowers bloom gone the woman boards the morning train, blows kisses back to him. The engine lurching forward, he waves to reflections in the panes. Horn blasts its cold intentions to deposit her back home. No one conceives of the secret sealed that night. Not even the child would know. None but the goddess who dances in delight, revels in the creation, waiting to unfold. Is that what's sinking? It's sinking. To my navel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have. Um, all kinds of time. Don't okay. Worry. Okay. Um, well, I have in my in my years written poems, um, ekphrastic poems, which you often I well I started doing them with uh, art painting, usually paintings. But then I am I was lucky enough to 
sit in the room with the beautiful grand piano music playing and just write poetry. That is a wonderful experience. So um, Michael Smith is here even, and uh, maybe I'll do the first one, start with Shostakovich. Um, Opus 134, in case you want to write that down, is a wonderful piece. Okay, this is called Duplicity, Russia, 1944. One, he, fragile and nervously agile, vulnerable and more receptive than most. A traitor, no. His internal monologue to stay alive, endure corruption and chaos. Play the patterns, break the patterns. Duplicity trudges forward in two black boots over cold stones. Complicity keeps him alive. Determination to survive, never to speak of the dead, but to weave discreetly folk songs of the dead into composition. Two. Me, fragile and nervously agile, keeping war and rumors of war at arm's length. In front of me, two musicians struggle with their music, sharp contrast, slight melodies. I absorb the song of piano and violin into my skin. Nerves spike, spiral down in relief. Rise again in tension, release. Today, more than ever, I want to sing, create expression among shadows. His theme ringing within me compels me to find the opening for desire to escape. I spend years confiding to the sky, but what of this life inside me? Let me forget our human frailty, forget there is no easy road in which to flee. That's a little heavy. Here's a lighter one. And I don't, I, I don't have the piece, I didn't have it on this copy, so forgive me that, that, that I was listening to. But it's called The Starving Masses, and it is not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> The pianist said the musical notes were birthed on the 12th floor issued as they were from violin and grand piano. Violinist said, no, they were simply released, dispersed like mana to the masses, scattered to the city below. The music fell upon women waiting at their windowsills catching it like falling snow to savor its flavor and waltz with it, weep with it, comprehend the language that it speaks. Onto passerby the music fell, onto parched skin that absorbed it in. Only those most desperate, filling their pockets by the handful. Not a drop of music had ever turned up lost. Okay, um, I'm gonna read just two more. And that um, one of these is a broadside that Juniper Moon so graciously printed and um, has available for anyone that wants to um, to, well, there's one on the back table that you can see, and then you can talk to her about, about purchasing one. Okay, this is called Water Life, What We Didn't Know Then. We, young under starlit sky, could hear the nightly nudging, slow crumbling, the dragging of shoreline into the mouth of the sea. Lullaby by its rhythm, 
waves inching closer and closer, and could not see we were cradled in its ebb and flow. The ocean fingers digging at earthen seams, enough to split the ground below us. Nor did we know the moon had a hand in the whole thing too, pulling and pushing and dragging away. If the haziness had cleared and the moon string seen, that they were stitched and tied in double knots into our lives too, would I continue to deny it or blame myself for water life undulating in me? Aware of its strength, why stay captured still by the gaze of the old moon's face? Okay. Uh, one more. One more. Thanks for being such a good audience, too. Yeah. Balancing the books. Okay. Your eyes deep brown glance across the room to find blue eyes of mine. Quick measurement in split second time. Cryptic system to read a person's worth. Without so much as a smile, I assume your teeth are straight, your bones are good, and surely you had a cute baby face. Advanced math for women teaches scrutiny. Besides the liar, cheater, bad drinker, consider what is cloaked behind the smile. That even with chisel and kisses, you will never uncover what the beloved determined to omit. Open a spreadsheet, women. Add up the costs. Count the clear benefits. You cannot afford to guess. And if you do what nearly every woman does, and guess, and then wonder how you got where you got, weary monologue in your head, remember, your value on the page has a way of incremental increase. The scrapes, bruises, and tears combined with good days, smile lines, collection of years, those worn pieces of glass smoothed by the sea hold value, are at the core that figure most in the intimate life of one, and when adjusting the books in the intimate life of two. Do you want me to go slower? Did I read it too fast? No. I thought it was fine. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. I just okay. Hear okay. I'm um, greedy that way. Oh, that's great. Greed, greedy's good when it comes to poetry. <laughs> A nod to death. The 
way we think about dying doesn't seem thought out. It is how we meet it that matters most. Creatures of fertile minds, why the lean possibilities? The ivy, ivy strangling us from speaking. We grapple with a theory of nothing. The lights go out, that's it. I want an open door, door with the yellow light drawing me through to beyond my knowing. Damp and wet, enclosed too long inside the body, my spirit may head south, bask in the sun on a high plateau. I'll be ready if the door is close, lying in yoga's last pose, the death pose, where I breathe slowly, inhale, exhale, taking the time to find the place of peace. Loosen my grip, let go. I see it's a good way to die. See, I need more practice. But no, absolutely not will I trade my last few days fighting the fight with death nor in my final hours start the fatal gasping in a struggle with my fears. Wasn't that terrific? So um, a couple of things. So uh, we have, I guess we have an open mic list making its way around. So if you want to read it in the open mic, sign up on the open mic list. We also have a mailing list in the back. So if you want to be on the mailing list, you sign up on the mailing list. list. Um, you have some broadsides back there. How much are the broadsides? Seven. Seven dollars for the bouncing. At the meeting, there's seven. It's from the website now. Okay. So it's a discount if you act now. <laughs> um, so uh, look at the broadsides, eat the cookies, and drink whatever we have back there. Uh, and I'm making tea. She's making tea. Yeah. So yeah. she's steep your tea and drink your, <laughs> eat your cookies, and then we'll come back in about 10-15 minutes and we'll do the open mic.